Okay, welcome to another episode of Bitcoin Tech Talk. Uh, as usual, my newsletter can be found at jimmysong.substack.com and I send out a newsletter every Monday morning at 9 a.m. So this is a read-through of that very newsletter um, that I sent out this morning. Um, and the title is Why All Coins Aren't Copying Taproot, Bitcoin Tech Talk, issue number 244. Taproot locked in this past week and Bitcoiners celebrated. All coiners, on the other hand, couldn't care less. I suspect that they don't even know what it is or what it's supposed to do. And why should they? All coin developers haven't shown the slightest interest in adding Taproot to their code bases. The question is, why aren't they interested? What pre what's preventing them from embracing what are some very clear wins? There are three reasons for this, which I'll explore today. First, all coins are perpetually lacking in developers. Ironically, many of them are getting paid, usually through the Prima or some continuing developer subsidy. But it is, it is nevertheless difficult to get developers there to implement anything, even if it's a line-by-line -line port of Bitcoin Core's code. Not only do upgrades like Taproot require a good understanding of the math and computer science behind the constructs, but they require good testers, documenters, and adversarial thinkers that can figure out how the new feature interacts with whatever is available on their platform. All coins lack this, so they mostly just stay static and don't bother with obvious user, obvious user empowering upgrades like Taproot because they don't have the developers to do it. Second, all coins have their own marketing to push. A coin founded on proof of stake has to make proof of stake compelling. Whatever developer resources they have tends to go toward what centralized marketing message, faster transactions, privacy, dentists that they're trying to push. These are organizations that are very much top down, meaning that all the developers are committed to a roadmap, and that doesn't include off map projects like Taproot. It would hurt their marketing message too much. Third, all coins are centralized. As a result, getting better block efficiency, faster signature verification, or reducing the specs necessary to run a full node are not the least bit interesting to all coins. They all already know that they're centralized, so why bother with optimizing anything? Why bother running a full, making a running, <coughs> why bother making a, uh, make, why bother make running a full node easier when it's already really difficult and few people run them anyway? In other words, all corners don't care about features that help individuals have self-sovereignty. The upshot of all this is that all coins are exposing their products to the decentralized theater to be the decentralized theater that it is. As much lip service they give to that word, uh, the fact that they don't give features like Taproot priority shows that they really like centralization and not empowering users. Contrast this with Bitcoin, which empowers users by giving them the ability to verify and not trust. In other words, all coins aren't copying Taproot because they like centralization and have no interest in undermining that. The other myth that we can stop right now is that all coins are a testing ground for Bitcoin. Yes, Litecoin did that for SegWit very briefly in 2017, but literally no other coin has shown uh, interest in the features that Bitcoin wants to implement. No other protocol has any interest in any prev out or cross input signature aggregation or op CTV. Far from getting, uh, far from being a testing ground, they're also utterly incompetent that they wouldn't be able to implement any of these features, let alone see if they work. Ultimately, this is because all coins really are centralized and these features just look too hard to the rent seeking developers who may maintain those other coins. So this is, uh, uh, an article that I essentially wrote yesterday, noticing that, you know, there's very little enthusiasm um, about Taproot, except among Bitcoin maximalists, everybody else couldn't care less. Uh, and especially sort of like the crypto people that uh, almost always try to spin anything good for Bitcoin as being good for their coin as well. Um, they can't really do that with Taproot because none of them want to integrate Taproot. It's uh, it's not a priority for them. And it's not a priority for them because they know they're centralized. <laughs> like there's there's no desire to make uh, 
you know, running a full node easier, or cheaper, or faster, or whatever. Instead, it's all about, oh, we'll just, uh, you know, uh, add this marketing feature so we can uh, sell a few more tokens and pump the price a little more. Something to that effect. All right, let's talk about Bitcoin. Uh, Taproot locked in on Sunday, Saturday morning in the U.S. around noontime in Europe and dinner in Asia, Australia. The actual lock-in took a little longer than expected due to some hashing power disappearing off the network, probably due to the China crackdown. Nevertheless, the difficulty adjustment period has something like 98% plus signaling for Taproot, meaning that we're all set to have Taproot activated on the network in November. So um, Taproot is locked in. The difficulty adjustment period is over. Um, and, you know, mid-November, I think, Currently, it's projected to be November 13th. We will have taproot transactions on the network, which is very exciting. Galoi is an open source community based Bitcoin wallet. The idea is to offer something between a self custody open source wallet and an exchange provided closed source wallet where you can only see a balance. They strive to make it easier to onboard with a community driven open source wallet that's custodied by a central party for use in local communities. It's a nice middle step to help people, especially in third world countries, get more comfortable with Bitcoin. Um, so it, it's interesting. It's going to be in sort of like a trusted community where, you know, people don't want to handle their own keys just yet. And for third world countries, I think uh, this sort of thing makes all the sense in the world. Congrats to Drew Meta and Yarol Rodriguez, who are now being sub uh, sponsored by Gemini for their core development work. It's great to see more developers get the funding they need. Um, Druv also got funded, I think, uh, by HRF. Uh, but yeah, the Gemini is stepping up their game in funding core developers, so good on them. Bitrefill has a thread on what they've been using in Sal El Salvador, what they've been doing in El Salvador. Among other things, they settled 10,000 Lightning transactions in a single day. Pretty remarkable that everything just simply works. I hope they and other Lightning companies continue to build out the right tools so people can make the infrastructure around El Salvador and whatever other countries to come to become more robust. Um, so a lot of the uh, what's happening in El Salvador is really sort of kind of bottom up. Um, you can uh, Bitcoin Beach is a major thing in El Salvador and. According to Bid Refill, they, they alone had to you know process like 10,000 transactions just within Bitcoin Beach. Um, I suspect that there's even more than that on a daily basis. So, uh, you know, President Bukele, I think, is uh, is following where his country is going already and sort of securing things for everybody. Economics, engineering, etc. Nick Baccia analyzes the narrative change after the El Salvador announcement. Peter St. Onge does one as well, as does Hodel Onward. All three of these hit on some different angles for analysis and give interesting perspectives on what might happen next. Everyone agrees this is good for El Salvador, and it likely starts the game of one-upsmanship with other states for Bitcoin supremacy. So um, all three uh, pieces are definitely worth reading in full. But essentially, um, there is sort of like an international game theory that starts uh, as a result of El Salvador, uh, you know, adopting Bitcoin as legal tender. Um, it might take a few years for the second move, uh, but I, I really do think that this is the beginning of something crazy. Russell Kung uh, urges Nigeria to adopt Bitcoin. This is a letter addressed to the president of Nigeria to get the country to adopt Bitcoin. Bitcoin is already popular among many in that country, and it's only a matter of time until this happens. And I hope his voice can nudge them in the right direction. Uh, so Rus Russell is Nigerian uh, by ethnicity. Uh, so when he's writing to the Nigerian government, I think he's he's really trying to influence them and showing them, hey, like this is a really good thing. And Instead of like sort of oppressing Nigerians from uh, using Bitcoin, he's making the argument that it should go the other way. Um, and there are a lot of Nigerians that love Bitcoin. So um, it, 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 I, they make sense as sort of like another potential uh, government that can embrace Bitcoin as well. 
Tomer Strolight has a wonderful long read about art, integrity, Bitcoin, and NFTs. I found the idea of integrity in art to ring true, and NFTs, as the article argues, are really way too easy to produce, resulting in the silliness we've seen. Real art has some proof of work, as he highlights in the art by Fractal and Crypt. Um, so, yeah, there there is sort of like a, an integrity to art, uh, which really requires proof of work. And NFTs require no proof of work whatsoever. It really, it literally is just like a single ledger entry. Um, and there's so many charlatans coming in trying to sell their NFT to uh, their sucker fan bases, I guess. Um, and I feel really bad for those fans that end up buying this stuff because it really isn't worth anything. <coughs> Jeremy Hildreth makes the case that Bitcoin is something like the meter, which will allow economics to become more of a science. As there is absolute scarcity, we can objectively measure other things in economics with Bitcoin. The idea is intriguing in that economics, especially macroeconomics, uh, has suffered from the lack of objective metrics and has instead relied on ridiculous cumulative numbers like GDP and CPI. I would love to see what economics does with Bitcoin in the next 30 years. And this is uh, this is something that I think uh, Safe hinted at with the Bitcoin standard and so on. Um, but, you know, economics, everything is relative. Everything is variable and so on. Um, Bitcoin might be the first thing that isn't. Uh, there's 21 million and that's it. Uh, and that absolute scarcity means that we might actually have the meter. And that's a very good thing. Kyle Torpy gives Paul Krugman a cruel fisking over his stance on Bitcoin the past 10 years. Let's just say that Krugman has been wrong over and over again, and Kyle takes him to task for it. Then again, being a Keynesian economist, he doesn't actually have to be right on anything. He just has to say what the oligarchs want him to say, which he'll do with fanciful justifications. Good on Kyle for documenting his history of wrongness. Yeah, um, I think uh, Kyle did a great job and he wrote for Reason Magazine for that particular uh, article and he just documents all the ways in which Paul Grugman has been wrong on Bitcoin. He's been wrong on a lot of other things too, but uh, on Bitcoin it's especially egregious. Quick hits. Here's what happened regarding the Colonial Pipeline, the FBI, and they're not very believable claims. Um, this is you know their claim that they could just go get private keys or something like that uh, and this is not the case um china really looks like they're banning mining um a lot of miners are, <coughs> are looking to get out of china mining equipment is being leaving china at the moment um yeah that seems to be the case for sure coin metrics has some interesting statistics on stable coins so that article has you know, like how much of what exists and so on. Uh, Texas state charter banks can custody Bitcoin. This will be interesting, especially since I live in Texas. If there's some that can custody some Bitcoin for me, then maybe maybe might be worth putting at least a little bit in. I will be at the Bitcoin Standard Conference on August 12th to 14th in Mexico and Bitblock Boom in Dallas on August 26th to 29th. Um, the Programming Blockchain Seminar is in Mexico on August 10th and 11th. This is a two-day seminar for programmers to learn about Bitcoin. You can apply here. I also have a few scholarships available for those that can't afford it. Um, yeah, those are all available if you are interested. Um, please check the website, programmingbitcoin.com. On this week's Bitcoin Fixes This, I took listener questions. I covered Taproot, all the stuff going on in China, and of course, El Salvador. I read through last week's newsletter on Twitter Spaces, and you can find it here. Here is my panel with Jameson Lobb, Michael Flaxman, and Michael Perklin talking about Bitcoin security at the MIT Bitcoin Expo back in March. Um, I was also on a very long episode of Bitcoin Brief with Tone Bays and Bitcoin Mechanic, where we talked about El Salvador, China, and BitCloud. Um, lastly, I was on Real Vision to talk about the new book. Uh, my other books are, of course, here. Uh, and you can go buy them on Amazon. And lastly, uh, Unchained Capital is a sponsor of this newsletter. I joined as an advisor to be a part of a company that's enhancing the security for Bitcoin holders. If you need multi-sig collaborative custody or Bitcoin native financial services, learn more at unchainedcapital.com. Fiat Delenda S. All right, guys, thank you. Um, and that 
wraps it up for this episode of Bitcoin Tech Talk. Um, kind of a short one today, uh, but yeah, and hopefully we'll see a little more, uh, more happening uh, as price is kind of going up a little bit. All right.